Thank you. Good morning, Ivan. Great to have you on the chat. Ivan and I just had a little one on one chat. Ivan is one of my options mentoring mentees. Is that a word? I think something like that. I know it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to be able to talk to some of you one on one. And we're making some serious strides. So if you want to check that out, there are literally two spots available options mentoring. Uh, program is a 90-day program to basically accelerate your wealth, make you into a very successful options trader and much, much more. Go to felixfrance.org slash coaching and book a call with us to find out the details. Now, what did I really want to talk to you about? This isn't financial advice. I should always say that, right? I should always kick things off with that. This is what I want to talk to you about. This is just out like this very second. I was just staring at it, trying to get wrap my my head around it. And it's the most baffling set of data I've seen in some time. <laughs> Why is it baffling? And should it be baffling? Well, yes. I'm going to put a slight echo here. Okay, that's better. So we've got some really important jobs data out here. The first one, the challenger job cuts, is basically, these are intended job cuts. So if I could re-find my mouse, here it is. These are intended job cuts that basically companies have planned for in May. 20,700 job cuts. The previous month, it was 24,000. We were expecting 26,000 job cuts. So companies are not cutting jobs at the rate where you expect them to. So what does that mean? Well, it probably just means that the labor market's tight and people don't want to fire people because it's pretty hard to hire new people. They might be more expensive than the people you'd have to fire. The ADP employment change is the real increase in private sector hiring. This is basically private hires. And we were expecting 300, maybe even somewhere between 200 and 300,000 hires this month. We got 128. So that's a staggering, staggering decline. And what does that say? Well, it's getting going to get complicated. That basically says less demand for labor. Right? The first one up here is basically saying clinging on to labor. Labor costs went up 1% more than we were expecting. So that's higher labor costs. We can add that to the list. Higher than expected labor costs. And what does that do? Well, that causes inflation, right? That's higher inflation for sure. Non-farm productivity, uh, that's kind of in line. That's not really a big item. Uh, initial jobless claims. <laughs> this is kind of where the data gets funky. Because I was thinking of this, this is weird. So we were expecting 210,000 unemployed people, right? This is basically unemployment in May. So there is less unemployment in May. And this is a really odd one. So we have less unemployment than expected. which again causes more inflation because it shows that the labor market's tight. And then over the continuing jobless claims here, these ones, so people who continue to be unemployed, that number is also down. So these numbers are all lower than expected. So we are essentially seeing still a very, very tight labor market and less hiring. So the question is really that, that, that it begs us, are people hiring less because, I mean, substantially less, like half the amount we were expecting, because there isn't anybody available to hire? Or are they hiring less because they're concerned about the economy? If it was the latter, if people are, the companies are concerned about the economy, that would be good for our inflation fears, as you know, us investors. But the fact that we have higher labor costs so just to like sum this up basically we have higher wages essentially we have lower unemployment 
This is all then, you know, than expe expected. And then we have significantly less new hires. So these two are definitely pushing inflation up and therefore going to make the Fed, you know, go, go more nuts, go more, more full out, uh, get the bazooka out. The less new hires, if that was to coincide with rising unemployment, that's what the Fed wants to see. But really, I actually think this just shows that there is, there's, you know, a shortage of labor. There's just a shortage of labor out there. And therefore, that also, from my reading, is also inflationary. And therefore, this data is really, really, really not what the Fed wants to see. Um, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to sh shout them out. I will read the comments. And um, you, you can watch me at twice the speed. I, I, I actually, I'm trying to speak a little bit more slowly because I appreciate some of you find it a little bit irritating if somebody talks like this, right? A little bit hard to understand. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, Robert, good morning to you. I'm also super excited, Robert. You're joining the coaching program you just have. I look forward to speaking with you on Sunday. Um, that's going to be going to be a great blast. So we've got loads of coaching students on here. Actually, it's a really small group. It's like a it's like a dozen people um, because I do one on ones with you guys. So I, I literally haven't got that much time, but I've got two spots available. So check it out. Go to FelixFriends.org/coaching if you want to be coached by me personally and also my fabulous coaches. Um, then then check it out. FelixFriends.org/coaching. Now, good morning to everybody. Good morning, uh, Christian, Robert, Doru, everybody who's just joined. Uh, Daniel thinks the bazooka is already out. Effect on the market. Well, do, do you want to see the market or you're not, you're not interested? Now, the market's always a little bit laggy. The futures at the moment are still kind of roughly where they were about 15 minutes ago. We look at the expanded, the extended market here. Mullins down. Well, that's just a pure speculation nonsense. Um, Netflix down a little bit. That's the only one so far. Volatility is still down. I kind of think the market takes longer than nine minutes to absorb this, especially pre-market. Quite often, I find we're seeing the data in the morning, and then the market is like all excited and happy in the morning. And then after lunchtime, I sort of think that the market's like you know reading Bloomberg while they're chomping down the sandwich or something. And then they go, "Ooh, this video wasn't so good, was it?" Uh, and then things turn around. I don't know why it takes people so long to absorb data, but it, it does seem to take them quite a while. So, so far, so good. I mean, futures are broadly green, but not massively, half a percentage point, quarter percentage point. A lot of that's got to do with the fact that crude oil is down. And I mean, if I told you nine months ago that crude oil at $115 was going to be a good thing, I think you would have said I was crazy. It was 119 or even it was 120 something dollars just four days ago. So that's kind of positive. Uh, what's that relating to? I think it's probably because of the, um, the the colander that Europe calls uh, an embargo. It's leaking from all ends. I think that's basically why. And uh, possibly also Biden's trip to Saudi. That's expected. He's going to be on his knees begging for more oil. Um, not necessarily for the US, but more for the rest of the world, I think, really. Uh, copper prices are still up. Gas is still up. Ethanol, oats. So this is still, a lot of this is still uh, Ukraine. And then lumber falling some more. Could that be a sign of a slowing housing market? Is that what you need to build houses? Well, in the US, a lot of your houses are built out of wood, surprisingly. Not necessarily a bad material, but it is a little surprising. If you're coming from where I'm coming from. Uh, Birch Tree is saying, yeah, here, Jamie um, uh, from JP Morgan, he said to prepare for a hurricane. Well, yeah, I, I always take his statements with, a, with about uh, a shovel of salt. Because just like all the other great investors and great bankers out there, they don't ever say anything without some level of self-interest. So when Ray Dalio tells you that investing in China is the best thing since sliced bread, um, it's because he's setting up funds that he wants to expand because he wants to get a slice of the private pension fund market, which is just only just beginning. That's why he's doing that. So he kind of has to be saying those things. Um, I don't think he's necessarily saying that because he's put all his personal money into it. So you kind of have to always think about where are people coming from. It's like you know, Robert here on the chat highlighted that story. Was it Goldman's? He was he were tanking the lithium prices, which are, well, pretty strongly 
and they're basically saying that the demand is, is, is over, you know, lithium's over. Um, and of course it isn't from a physical demand point of view. And I don't think their, 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 their research paper made any sense whatsoever, but they still put it out. And maybe, maybe they put it out up here and maybe they did a little bit of shorting. Maybe they made a ton of money. And, and maybe that's, that was the deal. I'm not saying that's necessarily the intention because I don't wish to get sued by Goldman or whoever put that out. But it is, it is something that one could conclude uh, on one's own. So be careful with these statements. JP Morgan uh, basically saying uh, the market could turn a lot more sour. Could it? Yes, it could. Uh, why could it? Well, essentially, two things happening here. If you just look at the data this morning, right? Higher wages, lower unemployment, more labor shortages that causes more inflation. So the Fed isn't really having an impact yet. Now, one of the key things you learn if you study economics is that, well, what we were always taught is that whatever the Fed does, so central bank action has an 18-month time lag. And this is precisely, Jay Powell knows this, why he talks so much and why they are all on like some sort of, you know, panel every single day. Two of the of those uh, uh, monkeys are, are going to be talking today somewhere or another. And they do it every day. So they stay in the news because they know that their actual action of raising rates isn't going to tank the economy tomorrow. But if they create an expectation of a slowing economy, that happens much, much more quickly. So their policies are actually quite slow. So the problem typically with Fed or any central bank actions is that they keep raising rates and they stop when the economy slows. But because there is an 18-month time lag, they've actually, you know, they, they tend to cause a recession. So if you just think about this, if, if where's my pen? If this is interest rates, rates, and over time, you know, you sort of go up and you go up and you go up some more and you go up some more and then you go up some more and some more. And then you look at your GDP numbers down here, say, if this is GDP. Can you see that? No, you can't see that. There we go. And your GDP numbers continue to, you know, look pretty good, right? They keep going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. And then, sorry. So they keep going up all the way, and then suddenly they go down. And it's at that point where the Fed normally starts to go, okay, let's, uh, let's cut it a little bit. Let's do a little bit of this, right? But the problem is that the economy will then continue to go down for quite a lengthy period until you give it enough crack cocaine to recover again. And that's because this GDP down here is basically 18 months later or thereabouts to what's happening up there. So that's the problem. So, and, and, and I don't think necessarily they fully grasp that because they basically say, look, we want to see the data. We want to see a couple of months of declines. So what they're trying to do, or that, the, the way they're trying to kind of time this is by looking for this here and then trying to slow down there and then hoping that somehow the economy will slow down a little bit, but it'll sort of stabilize and then, you know, kind of recover a little bit here. But if you read the statement yesterday from, I think it was Bullard, he was basically saying the U.S. economy is growing at an unnatural rate. And he's saying the, the natural GDP growth rate should be about 1.75% and not any higher, which is not exactly what we want to hear, right? I mean, it's definitely a bit of a sobering thought if that's all the growth that we will be permitted. Um, that's true. I'm not going to read that out because it'll probably get the video delisted, but I appreciate your comments. Uh, Lostin says, 186 viewers, only 24 likes. More likes equals more food for Tallulah. Uh, Tallulah is my chief financial officer. She's a cat, a very small cat. So yes, please smash that like button. I truly appreciate that. Uh, Mohammed is asking about Salesforce. Well, I can show you what I like. I think about Salesforce. I didn't buy any Salesforce, but what I did instead, I thought it was stroke of genius. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I said I made options trade yesterday in the morning and I closed it in the evening. I made $150, 6% in one day, which is a staggering annualized rate. It's so staggering that Microsoft Excel can't, can't calculate it, you see. Uh, they don't like it. Well, it's because it starts and ends on the same day. They can't, they can't fathom why anybody would want to do that. Uh, but 
you can make money out of these moves quite quite easily. I don't know if I've got it on here, the CRM trade, do I? Yeah, here it is. Here's that, 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 that trade. So CRM was trading at $177. This is a little bit of, don't, don't obviously don't copy this trade. It's, it's over and done anyway. That's where it was trading. So I set up a trade saying I would make money everywhere north of $154. So it could have fallen $23 and I'd still be making money because I don't really care about the stock. I don't care about CRM. Yeah, the other numbers are decent. I think it's a horrendous software to use, but they're making a great, a great deal of money. So it's probably a good thing to invest in, but I, I haven't bought any. And I like to be market neutral. I don't want to care where it's going. And this is my kind of a trade. It has a 98% chance of profit. That is a 98% probability of profit. And it was so good. Within a week, by the way, it was so good. I just took, took the profits the same day. So you can make trades like this. And all you got to do is like do one or two trades like this every single day. And you know, you're making a lot of money. And without probability, will you make money? Yeah, you make 100 trades, you lose twice. Uh, the other 98 times you win. So it's, it's pretty staggeringly difficult to lose money with that kind of a trade. If you want to understand how that really functions, then uh, come and join our master options program. Here it is, slash options The coupon code GROW will disappear when? The end of the weekend. I don't hang about. But the people who are successful make decisions. They make decisions now. You ask them, do you want it? And they go, yes. Or they go, no. They don't typically say, well, let me think about it. Let me talk to my cat for a week. And then maybe I'll decide and have a little bit more time or maybe after the holidays. That's typically not what they do. So let me see some of the questions here. Uh, Robert asking, if the Fed hike, hike, hikes rates based on supply chain woes, what happens when the supply chain woes subside? Deflation. That's an interesting one, Robert. I, I, I like where you're coming from. So there was a statement out by, I want to say Brainard, but I can't remember who it was. No, it was the Fed governor, wasn't it? I think he was basically saying, we don't care if it's supply chain or wages or whatever it is. We need to get rates to 2%. So pretty hard to argue that supply chain isn't an inflationary factor when you're looking at oil futures of $115, right? Pretty hard to argue that isn't going to be a factor. And the Fed sort of pretends by looking at core inflation, which is inflation minus food and minus energy, which is really the corest thing that we have, right? I mean, take away everything, but leave me with food and with energy, and I'm okay. Take away food and energy, and I'll, I'll be gone in three days, <laughs> right? So it's the most baffling uh, massaging of statistics to basically uh, lie to people that you could possibly think of. It's so blatant, but because you call it core, everybody thinks, oh, that's the number we should be focusing on. No, of course, it's complete nonsense. Uh, but what, what Robert here is saying is, okay, so at the moment, what's causing inflation? So you have high input costs, which is essentially a, a factor of you know, lack of labor, because the U.S. has quite frankly stopped immigration. That's basically the, the, the cause of this. And uh, nobody seems to want to admit that, whether you like immigration or not. That's what happens when you shut borders. And supply uh, shortages, to put it politely. And that's a factor of many things. That's, uh, that's China. That's, uh, that's the Ukraine. And, and um, that's uh, shipping. We are taking the mickey and are faced with idiotic regulations around COVID and stuff like that. So if you keep raising rates, what do you do? So higher interest rates reduce demand. They do not reduce supply. They can't affect supply, and they, they very openly admit that. So if you keep tanking demand, you eventually get to negative GDP growth, right? You get into a recession. If then at the same time, for some magical reason, you know, China decides no longer to lock people up. Do you hear the people in the Shanghai Stock Exchange have been there since March in the office building? Seriously, locked in. Absolutely, well, staggering. Brave, apparently, is one way of looking at that, which is, I suppose it is. Keep the market running. Um, not, not sort of a, something you thought you'd have to worry about. Now, where did my mouse go again? Here it is. Um, but if your input costs suddenly fall, so suddenly all of your supply costs drop magically, then 
you get deflation, right? And deflation is sort of where we've been living for quite a while. I mean, depending on how you look at that, but a lot of things have gotten cheaper, right? I mean, computers and electronics have gotten cheaper, garments have gotten cheaper, most foods gotten cheaper, uh, with you know deliveries and price comparisons, most services, insurance, all that kind of stuff has typically gotten cheaper. So then you end up in a land where you have falling GDP and falling goods prices. When you really get into deflation, the problem with that is that it causes basically what Japan's experienced since the 90s. Prices fall. If prices fall, you don't buy stuff. And that's why when you are in Japan, which is the most magical country in the world, you see, uh, you know, you, you pick a car to pick you up and it's a 1978 Toyota, which is in perfect condition. It's waxed with an inch of his life and a man with white gloves picks you up and is incredibly polite and it's marvelous. But the reason he's driving a 1978 Toyota is because if he buys that same Toyota, if he buys a new Toyota, say it's $50,000 this year. So say, you know, new car, is uh, in, in, in year one right now, if you bought it, say it was $50,000. But you know that in year two, it'll be $48,000. And then in year three, it'll be $45,000 and, and, and so on, right? You, you, you see where I'm going with this. You would never end up buying a car because you just know, well, if I wait, the longer I wait, the cheaper it gets. And the same happened, happened with real estate and the same, of course, happens with any major expenditure. So everybody looks after and maintains what they have because the opportunity cost of buying something new is horrible. And what does that do? Well, that causes a recession because people stop buying stuff, right? And that's basically the, the, the Japan problem. And what have they done to get out of that? Well, they've just printed more money than anybody else. Uh, and that's sort of gotten them out of it a bit, but not, not 100%. Um, real estate is kind of doing all right, but the rest of it is still a bit bit on shaky ground. So sorry for the very long answer there to a short question. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Let me see what else is being asked here. Uh, you just saw a ghost behind me. Oh, crikey. Really? Other people in the room? Who would have thought? Um, smash the like button, says Nightbot. That's the only polite thing he's ever said. I'd appreciate it if you did. Uh, let's do a quick recap on where we are. Let's have a quick look at where markets have gone to Futures are still bright, a little bit less bright than they were. NASDAQ was up about half a percentage point now, 0.44. And if you look at the pre-market here live, what's up? Quite a lot up. Amazon, Etsy, near 1.5% up. Did you read that Morgan Stanley statement? Morgan Stanley thinks within the next 15 days, Neo is going to magically recover as a stock as their production picks up. I hope they're right. Palantir is up 0.8%. They've got news that their space contract got expanded by another 50, I want to say $54 million. So that's now a pretty juicy contract, something like, like in the $170 million um, dollar range. Uh, so it goes to show that US government contracts are pretty sticky, pretty sticky. And I think the way you always think about that is, you know, imagine you're an IT chap and you've just set up this whole database network, finally got all your data in order. Are you then going to change suppliers because someone comes along who's a few pennies or cents cheaper? Probably not, right? You're going to stick with it. It's too much of a pain in the neck. So kind of all the kind of quality stocks are rallying here. Palantir, PayPal, SoFi is up. QQQ up 0.54% overall here. Facebook up half a percentage point. Anything that's bleeding? Well, Mullen, Rivian, Snap, Moderna. Volatility is down a little, uh, just under one percentage point. And that's pretty much the only thing that's of interest there uh, from that. So, so far the market's taking these numbers within its stride. Let's see if Bloomberg's gotten around to writing a headline yet. U.S. companies add fewest jobs of pandemic recovery, data show. True. But also, this is the second headline, U.S. jobless claims edged lower amid, amid tight labor market. And that's the problem here, right? The, the adding fewer jobs... I don't think it's necessarily anything we think got anything to do with the, with the economic slowdown. I think it's got more to do with, with um, unavailability of labor. Um, sorry, my doorbell just rang. Would you give me 30 seconds?
Sorry about that. That was a little rude. Um, dog walker. No one else in the house. Um, I have to let him out. Otherwise, you know, panic will ensue. Limbs will be chewed. I appreciate your patience uh, sticking around. So, yeah, I, I think um, obviously the, the, the way the market presents this information is super important. The media presents information. So applications here sell unemployment fell to 200,000. Continuing claims continue to decrease to lowest level since 1969. That sort of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? And do they put any, any spin on this? Underscores the strength and tightness of the current jobs market, yes. The market shouldn't like this, especially the tech market shouldn't like this because a very tight labor market means needs untightening, right? And that means higher rates. Layers offs are a record lows and there's nearly two, nearly two job openings for each unemployed American. Uh, indeed, there is. So that's data proceeds Friday's jobs report, which is forecast to show unemployment rate fell to 3.5% in May, the lowest reading since 1969. Um, indeed. So we got that, that to look forward to tomorrow. Uh, quite a bit of data tomorrow morning as well. Farm, non farm payroll as well. And again, more data here on, uh, on, on PMI data and, and manufacturing and so on. Lots of payroll data. So if that's as tight as we expect it to be, I can't really see how the market's going to love it. I mean, the market, pre-market, often shrugs the stuff off. You also have to bear in mind that pre-market is a pretty thin market, and it's often a very retail-heavy market, um, which I'm not saying retail is less smart. I'm just saying retail tends to have a shorter time frame, and they might be buying the dip. But what is actually really shocking, and I just recorded a video on that, and I just wanted to share this with you br briefly here. Goldman's uh, data shows that all the retail money that poured into the market since December 1990, or since COVID, say, has basically left the market. So it's, it went up, and then it's all gone out again. So literally, retail has, has, has left the building. And it's it's, it's really quite tragic. Uh, I always show you this chart here. I think this is the, the most important investing chart. Uh, I used to have this on my wall, actually. I'm thinking about framing one uh, and giving it to everybody I meet because this is what it's all about. It's fun to buy when the market goes up. It's thrilling. It's exciting. It's euphoric. And then as it starts to fall, we get a little bit anxious, a little bit fearful. We despair. We panic. We surrender. And that's when retail sells. And that's, of course, the wrong thing to do. They've just handed all their hard-earned money over to some midtown vest wearer with a second Ferrari, thanks to your selling. And then when the market picks up again, optimism kicks back in. They're basically back at the beginning and they buy stuff again when it's expensive. And um, really one of the key missions here of this channel in our community is to stop people from doing this. I mean, literally, if I could restrain people from selling in, 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 in bear markets, I would, but all I can do is keep showing you this because it makes no sense. You just need to know that what you're owning is a good quality stock and you need to understand what makes a good quality stock. So you need to have the confidence. And if you don't, you need to learn it. You don't have to learn it from me, but you need to learn from somebody. Uh, that's also why I put out these these uh, benchmarks every other day. Here's the one, uh, seven potential 2x growth stocks. They're not what you expect them to be. Go to felixfriends.org slash seven stocks. It's completely free and it's a benchmark and the benchmark will help you understand what is a good company, what isn't a good company. And the other thing I always recommend you, you do is put your portfolio and whatever you're interested in in buying into the stock tracker dashboard here. Uh, and it'll tell you to start with how you're diversified across companies and industries, which is an important thing to understand. But much, much more importantly, understand understand your gross margins. Like, what's the average gross margin of your portfolio? If you don't know that, please find out. Because it's like owning a company and not knowing what the margins are. Like, if you own a company, you know what your margin is because that's what you own. And it's the same thing here. People treat stocks like it's not a real business. These are real businesses. If your neighbor said to you, hey, uh, will you lend me $50,000 to invest in my company? You'd ask them, what do you make? Who do you sell it to? How much money do you make? As in, what's your margin, right? Who's your competitor? You'd ask them these logical questions. You have to ask the same things before you buy stocks. Well, if you already have them, ask them now, because that's the only way you get there. So use a, use a, 
any kind of tracker dashboard that gives you live data, track it, write it down, have a notebook. You really want a notebook. You want to write down why you bought stocks. This is all the kind of stuff you got to do. This you can get at felixschwenz.org slash Patreon, links down below. Uh, it's like 20 cents a day to, to, to join that and you get access to tons of stuff, including this particular smart sheet. So that's really what I'd highly, highly, highly recommend you do because without knowing what you own, you are in danger of doing what all retail investors have just done in the US and they've sold. So if you're wondering why the market's down, it's retail sold. And if you look at a lot of the stocks that are down the most, institutional ownership has actually gone up. So what's happened here? Retail sold at high prices, institution at low prices, institutions buy it, pick it up. They have longer time horizons. You know, I'm talking pension funds. I'm talking guys who manage a lot of money for other people they have a longer time horizon and they know what makes a good company and they buy in these times they have inflows they can so please don't do this that everybody else is doing and and spread it literally tell people tell your friends uh, like this video that'll help subscribe that'll help seriously the more people do that the more people engage and interact the more we spread our message here so there is enough of my rant here let me see um uh, what what else are you guys are talking about here on the chat um Hello, hopes we're in, in, in the depression stays and not in de despondency. And you know what? You never know. You know what? You know where I am happiest? <laughs> I'm a strange person. I am happiest down here. Really. Like I celebrate every day the markets in that state. Why? Because it allows me to buy stocks at cheaper, cheaper valuations. I don't like it when we're at the top because I still make myself buy stocks, but I find it much harder to do. Um, I've looked at this chart for so long that I, I, I hope that there is panic every single day. I don't hope it for everybody else, obviously, but this is really where you want to be. You want to be happy when the market's tanking. You want to go, yay, I'm going to I'm gonna accumulate more wealth in these weeks and these months and this year, maybe the next year, uh, than, than I ever have before because I'm buying amazing stocks at cheaper prices. It's like, you know, if you like sales or something, it's the same thing. Uh, Anthony, it's, true. it's right. When you own garbage, you do need to sell. Yes, I think I think that's a fair statement. Uh, Mike, yes, it would imply that. It would imply that um, retail have sold more than institutions have bought. Of course, it depends on each stock, right? I mean, a lot of stocks are down just because their their fundamentals are very shaky. Twenty percent, twenty percent of all Russell three thousand companies cannot pay their interest. Staggering statistics. That's something like 628 companies or something do not have sufficient profits to pay just the interest payment. Forget about repayments. So you don't want to own those. And to avoid owning them, you need to understand, you know, what's the interest coverage ratio, right? What's the debt to equity ratio? And, and how is that compared to the industry? And you can look all that stuff up with any simple tracker like, like we do here, right? We look at debt to, debt to equity. Quick ratio is basically a measure of the company's capacity to pay its current liabilities without needing to sell inventory. I put definitions in the, in the title of these so you know what the hell they stand for. So like NVIDIA can very easily pay its debt. The factor is six. If you look at, um, I don't know what, we've got anything on here. GM is a bit, bit of a struggling one always. Um, you know, if you put Ford in here, for example, do we have Ford in here? I actually think we do. There we go. Three times more debt than equity. Is that a good place to be? I doubt it. I very much doubt it. Why do you want to have three times more debt than equity? It's not really a happy place to be, is it? And their quick ratio is one, which is super low. It really isn't, isn't a great place to be. But then, of course, you also need to look at free cash flow and, and, and other things like that and, and short-term kind of influences. But yeah. Um, Uh, Carnival Cruises? No, no, they can't pay their debt. No, that's one of those cases. That's it, that's a terrible, terrible setup. Uh, they've just issued some bonds. I want to say at eleven percent or ten and a half percent interest. When somebody pays you ten and a half percent interest, and I'm not talking about some sort of banana republic. I'm talking about a U.S. listed company. I think their last bond just issued is 
10.5%. I think they got $2 billion, something like that. And if you go at their, look at their, their November bond, I, I, I might be slightly off by a month here or so, was 6%. And I think they raised six billion, something like that. I'm, I might be a little bit off by, on these numbers, but it, the proportions are about right. So it, it shows you that the market is 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 really like going from six to ten point five. They're going risky as hell. That's basically what they're saying. No one's going to touch it unless you give us a lot of money for it. And of course, there's a, simply a reason for that that they might go out of business. Right now, there are some others in the travel space, some airlines and so on who are getting now sufficient cash flow in to be able to deleverage somewhat. Same with the oil companies, they had a pretty tough time. So there are some cyclical businesses. You kind of need to also appreciate that shipping, for example, uh, oil companies and so on. But I don't understand why people would buy something like Carnival or, or an airline, quite frankly. It's just like too much capital tied up and, and, and far too, too small a profit, a profit margin. So. Uh, good morning to you. I fall asleep when Biden speaks. <laughs> I think he talks himself to sleep. Uh, Robert's asking, did anybody come, anything come out of the Biden Powell meeting? I think the whole thing was a setup for Biden to say it wasn't me. I think that was the intention. And I think that's basically what his uh, spokesperson, that what's he called? Uh, I want to say D, the guy who's uh, sort of in, in charge of the economy, the guy who came from BlackRock. Can't think of the name now. Anyway, he um, basically, he wanted to stand next to Powell or be in a room with him and then put out a statement afterwards and say, we respect the independence of the Fed. And because we respect the independence of the Fed, it means inflation is nothing to do with me. It wasn't me. It wasn't my $1.9 trillion spending binge that caused any of this. No, 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 no. If inflation is a Fed, Fed responsibility and I will respect them enough to basically point the finger and says it's his fault. I think that's basically what it was about. So that Biden could come out saying he's he cares, but it wasn't his fault. So I don't think anything productive came out of that. Uh, hello, saying Microsoft cuts Q4 guidance due to FX impact. Interesting, because the dollar is so bleeding strong. I think that's probably why. We see that with a lot of companies, like you know the earnings of Netflix and companies like that, uh, because the US dollar against a basket of currencies. Can you see that little chart down here? It's gone up tremendously. So if you get a lot of revenue in in euros and in yen and in whatever currencies like Microsoft does, uh, then you will have lost probably three, four, five, six percent of that revenue when you convert it into US dollars because you have to report it in US dollars at current rates. Now that might actually be quite good for me because I've got a Microsoft trade open. Let me show it to you. That expires tomorrow. Yeah, it is good. There he is. This is my Microsoft trade that's open. And you can see that moving to the left. Oh, isn't that lovely? Oh, isn't that lovely? Look at the money it's generating. Marvelous. The red line is where the share price is. I make money as long as Microsoft stays below 275 by this Friday. And the further left it goes, it doesn't matter. I make money no matter where it goes. It can go to $1. It can go to, it doesn't really matter. It makes, it makes no difference to me. So the sort of trade that is, is it's, um, well, it's two calls essentially, which we sell. We sell one call, which makes us all the money, and then we buy a call to hedge our downside risk here. And so we, I, I like to limit my, my risk, and that's also what I teach my students is to uh, hedge. And um, you know, the very reason that hedge funds came up, because they created positions using fairly complex derivative products that were hedged. They would make the same amount of money no matter what happened to the stock. Stock could go down, stock could go up, they were hedged, they were making money. And that's obviously then changed. So they were making a lot of very small profits on a lot of trades. And now, unfortunately, a lot of hedge funds are no longer really hedge funds. They're just great big gamblers. They do still hedge, which is why you see a lot of them having put options and so on. But yeah, very nice. Microsoft down 2% this morning. I do own a lot of Microsoft, by the way. So that's not really why I'm celebrating. But I don't really care about the short-term share price because I don't have no incentive to sell it. But yeah, no, thanks very much for shouting that out. Uh, that makes... Um, Makes my morning really. <laughs> I might, I might be able to take some profits on that early if that continues like that, and that might also then, of course, move other big tech stocks because uh, the the same thing might might happen to 
Facebook, the same thing that might happen to Netflix and, and the other big giants who got a little, get a lot of their revenue from overseas, essentially. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Appreciate it. If the market uh, starts roaring upwards in the fall, do you expect to make more or less selling options? About the same. Uh, about the same. There's probably one time... Okay, so what's our advantage at the moment as an options trader? Well, VIX is really high. VIX determines options prices, right? So when options prices are high, and crikey, there's a lot of stuff on here, hey? Um, when options prices are high, we can sell options. So let me illustrate this here. Use a different pen. So a high VIX means high options premiums, essentially, or prices. It's the same thing. And we uh, therefore sell options. So we collect the premium and we collect more premium. We make more money. But with that, a high VIX also makes your charts look like this, right? Which makes it a little harder to set up trades. It means you need to hedge more. You need to have a little bit more. Well, your, your risk management is important. I think that's probably the, the best way to put that. Whereas a year ago, what I was setting up, so at the moment, my, my average trade at the moment looks like this. It's about, where's my pen again? It's about one week, which is really short. It's 80% plus probability. And I basically take profits early. So maybe at 50 to 75% of my max profit on the trade, I just take it because I want to I collect the cash because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow because every day is, is a little bit mad. Now, I do have my 87% probability, so I'm making money on, on average. But in a more normal market, you're... So this is now. In a more normal kind of quieter market, um, what you do is you probably have a three-week average time length of your trades. You still have an 80% probability. And you probably just leave it. You don't really do very much. <laughs> you just let it ride out the 80% probability and you'll make money. But that's really the, the only major difference. So it's a little bit more work at present. That's all I'm saying is because I'm, I'm setting up more trades. Whereas if I set up three weeks trades, I don't need to set that many up, right? I set up, I don't know, one a day, and then by the end of the month, I've got you know 21 trades uh, that are that are live. I don't really need to do very much more. So it it just changes a little bit our strategy, but fundamentally it's still the same setup. It's just we need to, you know. And again, there are certain strategies that I'm not using at the moment. Like everything I do at the moment has a has a limited downside because it's really important to protect our capital. That's our number one job uh, as an investor. It's always capital protection. Now, how's the market looking? Let me look at the futures here. Ah, you see that? Nasdaq's come down, as we said, minus 0.09% because the labor market is tight as I don't know what, but it's really, really tight. Uh, so tight as a rusted screw. And none of the news about oil prices falling and any, any of that is going to really matter today. So it's all about that. Tomorrow, more jobs data out. Tomorrow, we expect the lowest... In, uh, unemployment rate since 1969. Now, normally that would get a president an enormous landslide win at midterms. I'm not sure that's going to happen this time, even though he tries to blame the Fed for inflation. But I mean, who do you blame for, for inflation? I'd love to know. Would you put that in the comments below? I'd love to know. So uh, Tara asking, how much money do you need to start options trading with your course? All my money is in stocks. Um, I'm not willing to sell. So I just want to know how I can save up a couple of weeks. Uh, okay, the absolute minimum you need is a thousand bucks because each trade you make would ideally be. Where's my mouse? Each trade you make should be one to five percent of your portfolio. So um, one to five percent per trade. Now, if you have a thousand dollars, that would be ten to fifty dollars very difficult to set up trades for $10. So you can kind of forget that. So you're basically setting up $50 trades and that works. Uh, but when you join the program, I would strongly recommend that you paper trade for quite a few weeks. So you could join the program, you could paper trade for a month and get the experience 
make mistakes, screw up, ask us why, ask us for help. And then you walk away with, with actual experience and then you gradually start building up your options trading. I don't recommend anybody jumps in and just says, here is 50K, let's start trading because you'll lose money and you'll make mistakes. And, and you're going to want to be able to be calm when you make those mistakes. I make mistakes. Like I set up a trade yesterday. It's the wrong way around. I fat fingered it fine because I'm calm. I've done it before. I've made that mistake many times before. So I look at it, I can calmly address it and then, you know, we can, we can fix it. But the calmness, the emotions, uh, being able to remove the emotions is really, really important. I hope that answers your question. Um, righty hope. So on that note, I want to say a huge thank you to you. Um, if, uh, like Jadara, you wish to join the Master Options program, here it is, felixfriends.org slash options. There's a coupon code there, 41% off coupon. It's GROW. And I know some of you always think, well, there'll always be another coupon. And maybe there will, maybe there won't. But the cost of the programs has roughly doubled over the last year. So it gets bigger and better, and we have more support and coaches and everything else now. So do, do uh, bear that in mind. And as I mentioned, for coaching, for mentoring, I also have two more spots available. And that means that you're actually learning directly from me one-on-one -on -one, uh, and also with my coaches who are university lecturers and have taught options trading for more than 10 years. They really know what you're doing. So you're getting university education there one-on-one. -on -one. It's like private tuition. It's amazing. And it just allows you to basically get it all done in 90 days. It allows you to make enormous strides. We also sort out your portfolio and your long-term plans and everything else. And... Um, Check it out. Just go to felixfrenzelog slash coaching. Uh, there are very limited spots available, two, as I said, at present, simply because I've only got so many hours in the week and in the day where I can be available and jump on calls with people. And I want to be available for my, my, my coaching students uh, so that it's fun and that we make great progress and everybody's happy. So check it out. Thank you very much for tuning in. I wish you a beautiful day.